in a few moments, I'm going to give a talk on the influences of Marshall McLuhan and his insights into technology and how we use technology in the world and how it influences society. The learning objective for that is really just to understand the relevance of his work and others who have thought along the lines that he has, particularly to today's metaverse. Um, even though he was operating in the latter half of the 20th century, a lot of what he spoke about seems to have much more relevance to us today than it might even have had when he was writing about it originally. So today we're going to consider the work of Marshall McLuhan. He was a cultural and media theorist from Canada working in the second half of the 20th century. He used media to examine society at a time when Western civilization was on the cusp of major change. He referred to the time as the electric age, but we would be more familiar with it as the electronic era today. So now let me change the slide. One key example of the technological development of the time was the telephone, believe it or not. Although invented in the 19th century, with credit frequently given to the American Alexander Graham Bell, it wasn't until the mid 20th century when almost every household had a copper wire landline installed that its use became ubiquitous. By this time, the phone was invariably situated in a hallway or other such transient space, and it soon became one of the key communication tools for families. Radio and newspapers were giving way to television as the dominant form of entertainment, providing news, movies, shows and edutainment. Just like the telephone, there was generally only one TV in the house, often dominating the main family room so that everyone could watch together. So today I want to consider three particular aspects of McLuhan's philosophy, which can be described by these three typically short epigrams. The medium is the message, the global village, and we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. You may have heard of some of these or even all of them. But I don't want to bore you to death by talking nonstop for the entire class. So I'm going to rely on your engagement as we unpack these concepts and try to understand not only what McLuhan might have had in mind, but what value, if any, his ideas might have in our online digital environment today. So, what do you understand by the term, the medium is the message? Let's start by identifying what you think the term medium means. Can you give me some examples of media? So this is where you jump in with lots of examples. Feel free to use voice or use the nearby chat. Anybody? I did hear a little bit of typing, so television, exactly. Chats, blogs, websites. Yes, they are mediums, aren't they? Any others from anybody else? Digital media, videos, vlogs and blogs, yep. 
Okay. Sign language. There's a good one. Paper, books, exactly. Newspapers. Television. Clay and papyrus, indeed. So, as you can see, we have used lots of different media to communicate as human beings. Smoke signals, exactly, smoke signs. Could workshops be one? They could indeed, if they're communicating a message. Very good. Poker, charcoal, pencil, paint. The Vatican does indeed use smoke signs still to this day. So some media, media <clears throat> can actually have serious longevity. Thank you for those examples. Now thinking about them, how can they be the message? Surely the message is separate from the medium. For instance, when I confirm the final submission date for your assignments by email, surely the content, in other words, the actual submission date, is more important than the fact that you received an email instead of a verbal notification in class. In other words, the medium. What do you think? This is your chance to jump in again. Yeah. <laughs> Depends, yes. What does it depend on? The results of a court martial <laughs> are indicated. Written communication works for some. Sidearm suggests by what direction the sword is pointed. I have proof. Words go with the wind. That's true. So some some media are more um, secure than others, perhaps. Some media are easier to record than others. Okay. In the Australian interview that you were given to view in advance of this, McLuhan, and I'm sorry I didn't circulate this to everybody, but it won't matter. McLuhan has asked a similar question by a member of the audience who says, is this discussion now being held in the TV studio not important? And his response was to say that he did not say that content is unimportant, but that the impact is on, is of the content is far less than the impact of the medium. So let me say that again, because I, I stumbled a little bit. So his response was that he never said that content is unimportant. What he actually said was that the impact of content is far less than the impact of the medium. So anything I might say in an email has less impact than the fact that I'm using email and the infrastructure that supports this medium. Once again, what McLuhan is saying here is not immediately obvious. Considering our example again, you might think that the submission date for assignments has more impact on you than the manner in which it is announced. Let's look at an analogy from history, one that demonstrates the unforeseeable impact that a new medium might have had, not just on individuals, but on society in general. So we're going to talk about the development of the automobile. Try to imagine the world before the car. 
people travelled by foot or perhaps by horse. Most didn't travel very far from their homes that frequently. If they did need to go somewhere, the distance was usually not great. How far can you walk in a day? Or how far could a horse bring you in a day? Somewhere between 10 and 20 kilometres, perhaps. If you needed to travel any further, you would need to take a carriage, your own private carriage, if you were wealthy enough to own one, or a public coach otherwise. For example, a member of the Irish Parliament in the early 19th century, Daniel O'Connell, travelled from Dublin to his country house in Kerry to spend the summer by the ocean every year. The distance is about 300 kilometres, and it took him a week by carriage, stopping at a different roadside inn every night. I imagine the journey required much advanced planning, and there must have been quite a team of men and horses to complete it. Coach drivers, grooms, servants, and perhaps even guards to protect them from robbers and highwaymen who would take advantage of unwary travellers. You can see why the majority of people in the world never moved very far from the place they were born. Travel was difficult, expensive and dangerous. When the first horseless carriages began to appear, people found them either amusing or alarming. They certainly seemed rather harmless. No reason to suspect they would change the nature of our society. But eventually, the infrastructural change that was required to support the private automobile not only changed the physical landscape and environment, it also changed lives and social patterns that had never been disrupted to such an extent before, except for time, perhaps in times of war. The changes were rapid compared to previous developments. Within 40 years, there was a network of surfaced roads serviced by garages providing fuel and repair services. The teams of people that previously supported the traveller and the roadside inns that fed and accommodated them slowly began to disappear. The nature of society changed beyond all recognition. I can now travel from Dublin to Kerry and back in a single day. And I can do that regularly without having to plan very much in advance. People commute great distances to work because of the car. They can move from their birthplace with ease. On the other hand, society pays a price for this freedom. Massive numbers of people worldwide are killed in road accidents every day. The rural landscape has largely given way to urban development even more significantly, the increasing use of fossil fuels has contributed to global warming and the changing shape of our very environment. Do you think the early motor car drivers realised the impact their activity would have on the development of society? Do they believe the medium, in other words, the infrastructure that supports the car, roads, the petroleum industry, auto manufacturing industry, etc. Was the real message they needed to be aware of rather than the content of their short journey of their short journeys, mostly taken for pleasure in the early days. McLuhan's suggestion that the medium is the message is really saying that we need to look beyond the content to identify the real impact of any technology. Otherwise, we run the risk 
of allowing technology to lead us into danger, just as we have done by becoming reliant on non-renewable fossil fuels to sustain the lifestyles to which we have become accustomed. If there had been an awareness of this impact back in the 19th century, it might have led to a different outcome. Can you imagine different approaches that might have been taken towards harnessing the technology of the combustion engine? Any suggestions? How might human beings over a hundred years ago have developed a technology around the combustion engine that might not have brought the planet to its knees? What could we have done differently, do you think? Anybody? And don't leave it all to one or two people to comment. Everybody should join in. Are there countries today that do not use gasoline engines? I don't know, are there? We have dominance of fossil fuels indeed. Chantal thinks that we couldn't have done it any other way. Sidearm says the last time he read about defining middle class, it included owning a car and being able to send your kids to school. So one of the things that's dominant about the combustion engine is that it led to individual transport options. Everybody owned a car. But what if that motor had been put to use for communal transport? What if the development had been similar to railways, but maybe large buses, maybe even buses with um, several carriages like trains? There might have been less fumes emitted. We probably, as a society, may have ended up in the same place, but maybe it might have taken a few centuries more. What if we had sat down to think about the implications around the time the combustion engine was being developed? And as a society, we had foreseen the implications. It's possible we might have decided on a different way or a different approach. That's what McLuhan is saying in The Medium is the Message. He's suggesting that we need to look carefully at the impact of whatever medium it is we're developing and try and determine how it will affect society and whether those effects are positive or negative and whether the price is worth the ease. The price is the medium, exactly. Oseas says in the early 1980s, the Brazilian fleet reached the incredible mark of 80% powered by ethanol made from sugarcane, which is much less polluting than gasoline. The program was extinguished by the strong lobby of the oil industry. So once industries get that powerful, they can actually make decisions that are contrary to the good of society, simply because they're powerful enough and their continued wealth is dependent on that medium continuing in place. So at some stage it becomes too late. And usually, that's when the effects are being felt most strongly. Okay, let's continue. This 
so, the global village. What on earth is that? Does anyone have any ideas? Is this a phrase you've heard of before? Is it something you're familiar with? Yes, globalization. YMCA. Isn't there a certain contradiction in the term? Tall Ninja, you've heard of it before? In what context? Oops. <laughs> Image people. Global village people. It's certainly a term that was quite commonly heard when I was a student. Village tends to be used to undermine. But there is a contradiction, isn't there, in the term global and village, or bringing those two terms together. Because one implies scale and the other implies local. Henry Clinton used to quote, it takes a village to raise a child, yes. And we're certainly a global society now in terms of economics and finance. And village seems to have gotten into the mean. Well, let's explore it a little bit and see where we, where we go and see if we can figure out what McLuhan meant when he used that term, because he was the one to introduce it. <clears throat> the oral tradition of pre-literate society, when people in a village gathered around the fire for warmth and light at night, and to hear stories and share news, was dominant in human society for thousands of years, pretty much until the invention of writing, in fact. So probably hundreds of thousands of years. <clears throat> the main sense organ in use was the ear. And the nature of listening is communal and largely informal. Whether listening to someone talking or singing, people playing music, the crackling of the fire or other ambient sounds in the environment, they listened as part of a group while also engaging in other activities, tuning in and out as their attention shifted focus. Writing in itself did not really affect this lifestyle. It was something for the wealthy and educated elite. Books and manuscripts were rare and not widely available. The development of the printing press in the 15th century, however, was very significant because it supported the mass production of the written word and ultimately resulted in literacy becoming commonplace, even among the poor. With reading, the eye took over from the ear. And because the nature of reading is solitary, it required dedicated attention and quietness. Reading on one's own and the eventual development of first person narrative in literature led to a shift in focus from the communal to the individual. As the 20th century progressed, McLuhan observed families coming together to watch television communally. They gathered around the glowing CRT screen in a way that reminded him of the village campfire. Despite the pictures, he noted that television returned humans to the oral tradition and the use of the ear as the dominant organ. 
you guys are all probably too young to remember when terrestrial TV channels broadcast to rigid schedules and viewers were all watching the same shows simultaneously and often chatting together as the programme played in the background. This reminded McLuhan of people sitting around the campfire and it led him to coin the phrase, the global village. In some ways, he seemed to be anticipating the development of the internet and the World Wide Web, which has shrunk our sense of the world even more. Until the advent of the pandemic, we seem to be living in an incongruously large global village. Do you think that this is still the case? Or is globalization at an end? What is wrong with globalization? That's a good question. It's not the one we're looking at today. And nobody's suggesting, certainly I'm not suggesting globalization is wrong. I'm asking if you think it's coming to an end. You don't think so. You think it's going to increase. <laughs> People gather around smartphones, digital TVs and iPads to watch the Super Bowl. Yes, and the game together. It's the, Chantal suggests it's increasing. Tom Ninja says now they gather online to meet for activities. Like what are we doing now? It's only the beginning of globalization. Sidearm reckons in Ireland they watch some ball game. It's not the Super Bowl, but it's the same idea. <coughs> One of the things McLuhan spoke about was, and you are probably all too young to remember this, but when we watched television when I was a child, terrestrial TV beamed the same program into every home. So we knew on a Saturday night that everybody in the country was looking at the same TV show. And on Monday at work or at school, people spoke about what they saw. That was the sense that McLuhan coined the term global village because he said everybody was sitting around the communal campfire, but it was now a television and there were millions of people looking at it instead of tens. What I'm asking is with the breakup of that approach to television and the individualization that has come from everybody looking at their own channel, um, everybody engaged in different social media debates, is that a little bit like the advent of the book into oral society, where people fragment again and community fragments again? People have different shows they watch now. Maybe the shared interest groups are smaller. Yes, that, that's what I'm asking. So watch the Marvel Universe cinema. Some still talk about DC comics. One difference, I suppose, um, is that now the communities are still global. It may not be large as they were when millions of people were watching the same television channel. But the more fragmented communities we have now are still global because of the internet. And Assyrium says it's about social dynamics. Okay. Right arm suggests he'd go with that. Still global communities, but smaller memberships. So the third aphorism 
that I want to look at is it's not something McLuhan himself said, um, it was one of his students paraphrasing him. He said, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. So what do you think that might mean? Society pressure shapes us, not about tools, but follow, not sure about tools, but following trends. Yes, and we're subject to all kinds of outside forces. Go ahead, sidearm. Shattering at the remembrance in the days when we thought email was so handy. Well, to understand the concept, we first need to consider our definition of a tool. One of the texts I suggested you read describes McLuhan suggesting the part of a human, the hand, for instance, could merge with an object to create something new that did not exist before. The example he gave is a hammer hand. When I pick up a hammer, my hand changes, and so does the hammer, leading to a new entity, a hammer hand. This enables me to do things I couldn't do before. I can nail pieces of wood together to build structures to shelter my family. I can defend <clears throat> myself against attack. I can kill prey and eat meat to widen my diet of berries and nuts. In effect, I have intervened in my environment and shaped it more in my favor. This understanding of tools as extensions into our environment both broadens and complicates the issue. For example, in this context, language may be considered a tool. When we see tools in this context, McLuhan's ideas begin to come into sharper focus. We have seen how the development of the printing press led to major unforeseeable changes in the nature of human society. The shift from communal to individual led to a questioning of religious thought, the age of enlightenment, the industrial revolution, We looked at how the invention of the automobile led to equally massive changes in society and ultimately to global warming. That is what McLuhan was warning us about. The need to be conscious of the impact of our tools on society so that we can at least attempt to mitigate the unwanted outcomes of change. As we progress through the current digital transformation of society, this awareness might serve humanity very well. How do you think our current tools might change the future of society? Now this calls for real prescience and futurology, prediction. Think of some of the tools we use every day, the newer ones in particular. And try and imagine how they might affect our society in the future. Go ahead, Saitam. Okay, so first of all, I want to acknowledge to the class and the John that I am participating, not just recording because this is my favorite class and one I most closely identify with John and I took this course way back so I just want to acknowledge that I'm taking off my neutral hat and jumping in one of the tools that all of us here are right now learning is how to create objects in space and draw in 3d I just took an outsider to go look at the student challenge exhibits and they looked at one of the exhibits and it hit them in the heart they were like 
without reading anything, getting the message from seeing and walking through and hearing the sound effects of the exhibit, bam. Any other examples or predictions about how our current technology might change? We're certainly facing a major challenge. We're heading towards growing divide. Sight arms talking about communication and entertainment with learning. What impact do you think that might have on our society? Could it change our perceptions and behaviors? Technology is certainly a double edged sword here. <clears throat> Um, the French activist philosopher Bernard Stiegler, who always liked to introduce himself um, by telling people that he had served time for armed robbery in France before he became a philosopher, um, spoke about technology as a pharmacon. In other words, it was both the cure and the poison. So that's what you were really saying, Lucia. One of the um, leading game designers in the world, a man called John Carmack, who was one of the key people involved in getting the Oculus to market before Facebook owned the company, um, suggested in an interview uh, only two years ago that the virtual spaces that emerge from these this technology might in fact provide respite to those in the world who could no longer afford to live in the natural world so his, he was suggesting that as the world becomes um, our, our environment becomes more polluted our population continues to grow and that some people are not actually going to even be able to afford to live in the real world and they will be forced to live in a virtual space. What about that for a change that people might not have anticipated when they started playing games on the Oculus and the Vive and other headsets? Is that not dangerous? Well, you could also suggest that building roads was dangerous because it led to so many deaths through traffic accidents. There are a lot of dangers that emerge with our technologies that we as a society conveniently ignore or decide not to highlight because the convenience of the tool takes precedence. But imagine the change in both human nature and human beings and also in society if people were divided between those who live in the natural world and those who live in the virtual world. Living in a bubble and the tall ninja says learners are now very much getting used to ready available information and learning they are resisting the need to go into the journey of learning. That's a very interesting um, perspective tall ninja it's not if it's not easy to access and entertaining so as lucia mentioned it's challenging educators or it's challenging for educators but with new ai type of technologies we're also becoming the reality of learning and education needs to follow the flow of these new technologies and use them more certainly one of the things we need to do is to understand the technology. Um, and I don't think McLuhan was ever suggesting that technology should be either ignored or that we should argue against technology. He certainly wasn't a Luddite. But what he was suggesting was that we should learn to understand the impact of technology on our way of life, 
before that impact goes so far that it can't be changed. If we look at the word technology more closely, it can help us toward a more nuanced understanding of the term. It actually comes from the ancient Greek techne, which means a system or a method of making or doing, an art or a craft, a technique or a practice. Noel Fitzpatrick, Professor of Philosophy here in TU Dublin, suggests that this approach allows us to have a wider understanding of technology, not just as a tool, but also as a form of becoming human. So, through techne, and by that we mean all forms of techniques and practices, we actually become who we are, both as individuals and as a society. This means that technology is not simply about developing tools to help us intervene in our environment, it is also a way of becoming who we are. We shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. The human being is a form of technological life. That idea brings the impact of humanity on the planet into sharper focus, but perhaps we can leave that for another day.